Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Heavenly Father, we come to your word this morning. And many of us can't relate to what Paul is going through here. We can't relate to people dragging us off to be killed because of the gospel. We can't relate to being bound for the gospel, many of us. But we still have persecution in our lives. We still have uh, walls and boundaries that we need to overcome for the gospel. And we need to be prepared for whatever is ahead of us in our Christian life. No matter what we face, Lord, give us the strength, wisdom, and discernment to know the battles that we must fight and to know that we need to be bold for the gospel. And no matter what we see going on in our life, we always move forward because we have the cross in Jesus Christ. And we know that He accomplished everything for us. And now, all that you ask of us is for us to be obedient, to love you, and to love people, to love them enough to risk it all for the good news of Jesus Christ. So Lord, this morning I ask that you open our hearts by the power of the Holy Spirit to hear your truth. Your perfect word as it is written here in our language and that we realize that the importance of following your word over our emotions, our desires, even our own thought process and logic. Many times we have to do the right thing every time because Jesus always did for us. Lord, we love you because you first loved us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So this morning we see that Paul is having some persecution, struggles. And we see this mob of people that's coming up against him. So it makes us think, what causes mobs? What causes rioting? I mean, we know that in human nature, something causes us to want to come together and go up against other people in many ways. We see it all around the world. Um, but it's not always wrong to stand up and to come together and go against something when someone's being wrong. I don't know if you guys remember this. Some of you probably weren't even born, but in 1989 in China, in Tiananmen Square, there were students and protesters that came up against the communist government because they were being suppressed and beat down. And they wanted democratic reform. There was a million people that came together in Tiananmen Square. It's really not that big of a place. We actually went there when we were in China uh, when we had, uh, adopted uh, Sydney, when God brought her into our lives. But imagine a million people standing up and saying, no, we won't take this anymore. And if you remember, there, one of the most famous videos really ever was called The Tank Man. And it was a man who stood up with no weapons or anything and just stopped these communist military tanks by just holding his hand out. And it was symbolic of just these people standing there saying, we won't take this anymore. Now, there was a lot of violence that happened. And a lot of it came from the military, but even some of the protesters admitted that they, they had violence as well. And so it was a terrible situation. Uh, in 1992, in 1992, uh, in Los Angeles, there was also some riots. Uh, there was some racial tension and injustice within the police department. And when people saw a video, uh, they started to get together and they decided that they were going to stand up against this injustice. 
Now, the way that they handled it, of course, probably wasn't the best way, but they started looting, and there was chaos and violence in the city. But definitely their message was heard loud and clear. Uh, it doesn't just happen with governmental or religious things, though. I don't know if you guys keep up with soccer that much, but there's a, actually a term called hooliganism. And that's when soccer fans become very violent because their team lost or maybe there was just a bad call and they can actually cause <coughs> several people to be killed a lot of times in these uh, violent riots and mobs all over a sports game. Now you guys think Kentucky basketball is bad, but we usually just burn a couch whenever we win, so I don't really understand that either. Uh, but what is it about people that makes us want to do these things? Now you might be sitting there thinking, oh boy, I've never done this. I just sit in my home and I just live a modest life and I don't ever bother anybody. But eh, what about your Facebook page? I know that a lot of times, have you ever just tried to put a Bible verse on Twitter or Facebook or something uplifting and you think, man, this is, this is going to make somebody's day. And the next thing you know, somebody comes in from the side and says, I don't agree with that. And the next thing you know, there's like 50 people commenting on your Facebook and you thought that it was something that was going to be positive and uplifting like Halo. And so, so many times we can have the same temptation to pile on even on social media. So we know, there's not time to go into all of the uh, psychology of this, but we know that people behave differently in big crowds. People behave differently in big crowds. And the temptation for us to pile on to this mob mentality is very real. And we have to be very careful about that. Now, this is exactly what Paul is facing here in this section of Scripture. The main point that I want to get across this morning, or the main idea that I want to get for you to see here is that no matter how hard we try not to offend, our faith in Jesus Christ will sometimes cause others to lash out at us. But our faithfulness to God is more important than our popularity with the masses. So let's look at the first point I'd like to show here this morning. The first thing I'd like to show you is a warm welcome. Starting in verse 17 through verse 19, a warm welcome. Look in your Bibles or follow along on the screen. Verse 17. When we reached Jerusalem, the brothers and sisters welcomed <coughs> us warmly. And so just to kind of get the setting going here, in case you weren't here last week, or um, basically what's happened here is Paul has been traveling. And he's been going all around the world, sharing the gospel with people, planting churches. And he's been persecuted, beaten down. Uh, he's been in chains. And, but he's also seen a lot of blessings as well. He's seen these churches planted. And he's been a part of these churches. And all these Christians that love him. But he has traveled an estimated 7,000 miles at this point. That's like walking from here to Juneau, Alaska and back. Over the past 8 to 10 years of his ministry. I mean, this is a long way. Now, he did take some ships here and there. But most of what he did was walking. And so he's walked thousands upon thousands of miles, and it hasn't been easy. He's actually worked a job as a tent maker. He's been persecuted, beat down, jailed, stoned. Everything in the world has happened to him. So you can imagine that he's tired. He's, he's physically older, and he probably is sore just from all of the things that have happened to him. So what happens? He comes to this church. He comes back to this church. And they welcome him warmly. The brethren, brothers and sisters in Christ. We had a brother one time, an older Christian, and he always talked about the brethren, how much he loved the brethren. And I mean, it was a special thing to him. He built his house to welcome the brethren, to have them live with him. And so it is something that we should know as a church, that we have a place to go that we have people that love us and that will welcome us. It's about hospitality. It's about being warm and welcoming to people. And so who is it in your life that you know that is warm and welcoming to you? You know who it is. It can be a parent. 
It could be a grandparent. It could be a spouse or children. Uh, someone in your life that you know that if you're having a bad day, you can give them a phone call or you can go see them and that they will fix you a cup of coffee and a piece of cake and sit there and talk to you and, and let you uh, talk to them and love you in spite of what's going on in your life. I know for me, when uh, Sandy's grandmother, uh, we called her Mama Georgie, she was still alive. Whenever I would go there, I always had such a peace because I knew that she loved us so much. She didn't require anything of us, and I didn't have to worry about anything that was going on in the world. I could just, every time I went there, I took a nap. It's because I could leave the world behind, and I always felt so loved and cared for there. And that's the way it should be with the church. And so as nice as all that is, we have to ask ourselves, are we being loving and caring to others? Are others? Are we welcoming others warmly as Paul saw the church doing here today? Do people come to you when they have struggles and when they're having problems? Or do they think, oh, I don't know, maybe they might judge me or maybe they might, uh, you know, put their <coughs> arm out like they don't want to deal with this right now. they got enough problems on their own. We need to think of others and we need to be that person as the church. We need to be the brethren. We need to be the people that, that anyone can come to. And, and sometimes people just need a shoulder to cry on. Sometimes they just need someone to listen to them. And that should be us. I read a quote last week from Pastor Ray Ortland on uh, Twitter. And he, he said, No one you meet today or any day will be suffering from over-encouragement. No one that you meet will be suffering from over-encouragement. Let's be the church that welcomes, comforts, supports, and loves people instead of criticizing, judging, gossiping, and tearing down. People get enough of that in the world around them today. I can't help but think, and I've used this illustration before, but when we went to Puerto Rico a couple years ago, and, you know, the, it was Hurricane Maria had happened, and all these people, they didn't have any... Uh, electricity, they didn't have any running water, and we didn't know what we to expect. There was like telephone poles down on the road, and we're traveling, and it's getting dark, and we're getting to this church. And we walk in there, and there's they have a generator for electricity, and they're lined up down the aisles, applauding us as we walk in. And it wasn't because we're something special, it's because they loved us, and they were happy to see us. And I've never felt more loved by any church than I did in Puerto Rico, especially knowing that they did not know us at all. The only common thread that we had was through our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. But that's the way that we should be. We should be a safe place for people to come. Our brothers and sisters should always be able to come to us. Let's move on to verse 18. The following day, Paul went, Paul went in with us to James and all the elders were present. After reading them, he reported in detail what God had done among the Gentiles through his ministry. And so, here's Paul. He's going now to talk to the leadership, all the leaders of the church. This is James, the brother of our Lord Jesus, and all the other elders. And he's wanting to tell them what, he, what has happened with the Gentiles, or the non-Jews, uh, through his ministry. But notice the way that it's worded here. Paul doesn't get the glory, right? It says... What God had done among the Gentiles through his ministry. It doesn't say what Paul has done for God. This is the perspective that we should always have. Uh, God can use us and he will use us. He has a ministry for every one of us. But he always gets the glory. We don't. And why is that? That's because without him, we are nothing. We need the Lord. And only because of what Christ has done in our life. Do we even have a witness or a testimony at all? So we should never think, this is what I'm doing for God, but this is what God can do through me, in spite of me. I'm always surprised uh, sometimes when someone comes and tells me, hey, I was really blessed by something that you said the other day or whatever, and I'm thinking, wow, <laughs> that's the Lord working through me because I, you know, I know that I tend to be uh, not the greatest person sometimes. Maybe I'm not that loving person that, had, that could be a, a shoulder of crime. But God can use us, even though we're imperfect. In spite of our imperfectness, He can still use us, and He will accomplish what He wants to. 
So we should serve him boldly, but give him the glory. And that shows our humility and our gratefulness toward him when we do that. Now, just imagine this setting. Here's Paul. I mean, Paul has to be one of the greatest storytellers ever, right? He's traveled all around thousands of miles. He's seen all of these things that we can't even imagine. And now these people must be gathered around, just captivated by his storytelling. And Paul's just telling them all of the details of this and that and all the things that happened to him and how he narrowly escaped this. And, you know, one time he preached so long that a young man falls off of the third story and dies. And then he, uh, the Lord uses him to raise him back to life. I mean, my goodness, the stories that he must have had. And, of course, we have these reported in the Bible, whatever God wanted to tell us. But Paul must have been captivating this audience by narrating his adventures and just showing these people all of the things that he had done. And it must have been such an encouragement to those Christian leaders. Because I'm sure that they have a lot of struggles themselves. And so we, this is one of the instance where we should definitely be praying for church leaders. Uh, we should be praying, praying for all of our leaders. But church leaders have a lot of struggles. And they want things to be okay. And they want to point people to Christ. And so it's always good to give an encouraging word to Pastor Andy or John. And uh, so I want to ask you a question. When's the last time that you shared what Jesus is doing in your life? We all have amazing stories of what Jesus has done for us. And it's such an encouragement to those around us to share our testimony and to tell them what Jesus has done in our lives. So often we think that we have to have all of the theology and all of the Bible verses ready to get someone cornered so that they can do nothing but believe in Jesus. When really, just tell them about the love of Jesus Christ and share some Bible verses that have changed your life. Let God do the rest. Give Him the glory. It's not all about every word being right and every little detail of everything being correct. We definitely want to know our Bibles. And we definitely want to be able to share God's word with them. And we need to share the gospel. But share your testimony. Tell others what Jesus has done in your life. And let him work and see what happens. Not only that, it's a reminder to you what Jesus has done in your life. Because it's very easy to, for us to forget. And that's why we should always preach the gospel to ourselves daily. To remind us of who we are and who God is. The next thing that we see here is wearing out his welcome. Starting in verse 20. Wearing out his welcome. Look with me in verse 20. When they heard it, they glorified God and said, You see, brother, how many thousands of Jews there are who have believed, and they're all zealous for the law. So right here, we see, Paul said earlier, he gave the glory to God. Now what are they doing? They're glorifying God. They're not praising Paul for what he's done. They're glorifying the Lord. And so the leaders heard Paul's testimony and they glorified the Lord because Paul gave the glory to God. But I will tell you this, not everybody's happy to see Paul coming to Jerusalem. So we see this word here, which can be a comforting word when it says, but God. But when it says, but, sometimes you know we're getting ready to make a change here. So verse 21, but... They have been informed about you, that you are teaching all the Jews who are among the Gentiles to abandon Moses, telling them not to circumcise their children or to live according to our customs. So here we have uh, these Jews. They're believing Jews, so they trust in the Lord Jesus Christ. And, but they're still zealous for the law. That means that they still follow the same traditions that they've always followed. And they're just not completely accepting the Gentiles into their group. They just have little clicks. I think we can see that today in our denominations. Many times we take things that are not very important and make a big separation over them. But the important thing is that they're trusting in Jesus, but they're just having a little bit of problem with Paul. And what's happening here is Paul is teaching one thing, but they're hearing another. Paul is saying, you don't have to be circumcised to be saved. You don't have to circumcise your kids. You don't have to follow these little rules and laws. Jesus already did that for you. But the Jews are hearing, don't circumcise your children. 
don't follow these traditions and laws, and therefore they are outraged. And of course, this is not what Paul wanted to, to say, but Paul also addressed this in Galatians very clearly that he believes that Jesus is the only way and that the law does not save us. And so verse 22, so what is to be done? The leaders are trying to figure out how they can protect Paul because they realize these people are not going to be happy with Paul being there. What is to be done? They will certainly hear that you've come. Therefore, do what we tell you. We have four men who have made a vow. Take these men, purify yourself along with them, and pay for them to get their heads shaved. Then everyone will know that what you were told, or what they were told about you, amounts to nothing, but that you yourself are also careful in observing the law. With regard to the Gentiles who believe, we have written a letter containing our decision that they should keep themselves from food sacrifice and idols, from blood, from what is trying on, from uh, sexual immorality. And that was in Acts 15. That the only thing that the Jews really, the Jewish leaders really required was that they keep themselves from these things. I mean, food sacrifice and idols, from blood, from what's strangling them, from sexual immorality. These are the things that would completely separate them from the Jews. So do these few things, which sexual immorality is, we all should follow that anyway. We should all stay away from that. So these were the few things that they said that the Jews had to do, or that the uh, Gentiles had to do. And they didn't say anything about circumcision here. And so the leaders were coming up with a plan here to protect Paul because they knew that this mob was getting ready to happen. They knew that these people were getting ready to uprise against them. So they had Paul purify himself with these other four men that probably had just gone through the Nazarite vow and were finishing up. And so Paul was getting ready to go through these Jewish customs in order to make sure that he doesn't ruffle any feathers. And so what we see here is contextualization. And that's just a big word for meaning that when Paul wanted to share the gospel, he wanted to make sure that he was doing it within the context of the people that God had placed him in. And if you'll turn with me really quickly to uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 9, we'll read a couple of verses here. This is Paul's letter to the Corinthians, and we we'll start in verse 19. 1 Corinthians chapter 9, starting in verse 19. Although I am free from all and not anyone's slave, I have made myself a slave to everyone in order to win more people. To the Jews I became like a Jew to win Jews. To those under the law like one under the law, though I myself am not under the law, to win those under the law. To those who are without the law like one without the law, though I am not without God's law, but under the law of Christ, to win those without the law. To the weak I became weak in order to win the weak. I have become all things to all people, so that I may, by every possible means, save some. So it's okay for us to contextualize. It's okay for us to change the, the wording, the way that we talk, maybe the way that we dress, maybe the foods that we eat. But we never waver on the gospel in any way, shape, or form. And Paul would never do that. But we need to reach people where they're at. For instance, I'm from Eastern Kentucky. Do you think that a person from New York City could plant a church in Eastern Kentucky? I think they can. But if every illustration that they use is about the subway, ice skating in Central Park, riding the elevator in skyscrapers, waiting on taxis, I don't think they're going to get very far. If they go to someone's house and they say, I'd really prefer to eat vegan today, I don't think that they're going to honor that because that might work in New York City, but it's not going to work in Eastern Kentucky. So they need to think about their illustrations. They need to think about the way that they're talking to people in Eastern Kentucky. They may have to change the way that they dress. They may have to change the things that they eat and the illustrations that they use. We must reach people where they're at without wavering on the gospel. And so here, as I said, Paul's joining into a ritual cleansing, and he knows that Jesus is enough, so he's not wavering on the gospel, but he's still doing his best not to offend. If we offend somebody, let it be the gospel that offends them, not our unwillingness to change and our hard-heartedness toward others who are different than us. Let us learn from Paul in that way. Verse 26. 
So the next day, Paul took the men, having purified himself along with them, and entered the temple, announcing the completion of the purification days when the offering would be made for each of them. When the seven days were nearly over, some Jews from the province of Asia saw him in the temple, stirred up the whole crowd, and seized him, shouting, Fellow Israelites, help! This is the man who teaches everyone everywhere against our people, our law, and this place. What's more, he has also brought Greeks into the temple and has defiled this holy place. For they had previously seen Trophimus, the Ephesian, in the city with him. And they supposed that Paul had brought him into the temple. So they're making some uh, assumptions here, right? So this all started as a rumor. This all started as a rumor. And rumors are so da dangerous. And Satan loves gossip. He loves it when we, when we gossip and we share rumors. Without wood, fire goes out. Without the uh, gossip, c conflict dies down. Proverbs 26, 20. The Bible is full of warnings against gossip. And here we see gossip about Paul. Saying that he's against the Jewish traditions. And that he's also brought a Gentile into the temple, which is a capital offense. The fire has started, and now it has plenty of fuel. Now, this didn't just happen in Paul's day, as we talked about earlier. But let me ask you, have you ever said something negative about someone that you knew, that you didn't know for sure was true? I know that we always, we all have done this. There's no doubt about that. But this is very dangerous, and it's also very wrong. How many of you guys have played that memory game where you whisper a word in someone's ear and then they whisper to the next person, they whisper, and by the time it gets to the end, how many times is that word the same word that you whispered in the first person's ear? Almost never. That's the danger with rumors. Uh, years ago at Toyota, when we used to uh, have our raises were always different and now they're a little bit more leveled out, but there would always be rumors about what the raise would be. And they would say, oh, it's going to be $2. It's going to be $3. Next thing you know, it's $5. And then when we got a really good raise that was like a dollar, everybody was disappointed. So you had thousands of auto workers that were mad because they got a good raise because they thought they were going to get five times as much. That's the problem with rumors and with gossip. It's the same with politics. I used to love to debate politics. It was a hobby of mine. I just go to work and I just debate politics with people and they get all fired up and I get all fired up and I just loved it. But I was listening to the news and listening to all these political talk shows and I would just go to work and repeat what I heard. What's the problem with that? I wasn't actually debating the facts. I wasn't processing this myself and coming to my own conclusions. I was just parroting what someone else had said. And God has since convicted me that that's wrong, and I don't even hardly talk about politics anymore, but I had no idea if that stuff was true, and I didn't care. I just wanted to win the argument. I just wanted to prove those liberals wrong. And so that's what I did, and that was wrong. And now I don't do that anymore. But I will say this. If you decide that you want to talk about politics, learn about it. Understand what you're talking about. Learn about the different sides. Give the other person the benefit of the doubt. Don't just get out there and repeat the things that you've seen on TV or heard on a talk show. And this is also why when you read something on the internet, uh, maybe you see something on Facebook about somebody that you know, and you're really tempted to repeat it, don't. Do not put fuel on that fire. If you know the person, talk to them privately. If it's a leader or someone in the news, stay out of these hateful conversations. Don't slander people on social media. It's very dangerous, and it definitely is very unbecoming of a Christian. Again, if you want to talk about these things privately or if you want to discuss things, then learn. Learn the facts and understand the facts and do it with love and humility. Don't be out there shouting and screaming at people trying to win arguments. Because that's the mob mentality that came up against Paul. Now, no Christian should ever start or join into a gossip, into gossip or rumors. Ephesians 4.29 says, No foul language should come from your mouth, but only what is good for building up someone in need. Verse 30. The whole city was stirred up, 
and the people rushed together. They seized Paul, dragged him out of the temple, and once the gates and once the gates were shut. Now remember, if you read up here in verse 27, some Jews from the province of Asia, people that weren't even from Jerusalem, started this. But they stirred up the whole crowd. The whole city was now completely uh, enraged. And this was a full-blown mob. It was a witch hunt. And what they wanted was they wanted Paul's blood. They wanted him dead. That's all they wanted. And they weren't going to stop until they got it. And so this all started from rumors and gossip. We need to remember that. And Paul is in grave danger. But guess what? Paul already said that he doesn't care if he dies for the gospel of Jesus Christ. So the only thing that they can do to stop him is kill him. But of course we have a sovereign God. So the last thing that I want to show here is a welcomed interruption. A welcomed interruption from verses 31 through 36. Let's look at verse 31 together. As they were trying to kill him, word went up to the commander of the regiment that all Jerusalem was in chaos. Taking along soldiers and centurions, he immediately ran down to them. Seeing the commander and the soldiers, they stopped beating Paul. Then the commander approached, took him into custody, ordered him to be bound with two chains. He asked him who he was and what he had done. Some of the crowd were shouting one thing, some another. Since he was not able to give reliable information because of the uproar, he ordered him to be taken into the barracks. When Paul got to the steps, he had to be carried by the soldiers because of the violence of the crowd. For the mass of people followed, yelling, Get rid of him. So what do we see here? We see a mob of people. They were out for blood. And they wanted Paul dead. And when we're reading the story, we might think, is this the end of Paul's ministry? As we're reading along, we may think, this, this may be it. This may be the end of, of Paul's ministry. Is God going to save him from this? But God does save him from this. And he uses unusual means, as many times he does. He uses secular government to save Paul from this bloodthirsty crowd. And he, he sends these soldiers down there. And as they go down there... They stop the violence because they know that if anybody can stop this riot, it, it would be the Roman government. And so they stop uh, beating Paul, and then, of course, Paul's still not in a very good situation because now he's bound by chains, which was already said that he would be bound by chains. He was already warned by the, uh, about that. Uh, but they stopped beating Paul, and the commander took him into custody, and then they took him back to, to the barracks. And they actually had to pick him up off of the ground to keep him away from the bloodthirsty crowd. That's how bad it was. But when I read this section of scripture, I can't help but see the parallels to someone else who was beaten and arrested by an angry mob of people. And that was our Savior, Jesus Christ. There's a lot of parallels here to, to the Gospels. He was bound. In John 18, 22, Matthew, uh, Mark uh, uh, 15, 1, Jesus was bound by the authorities. The government leaders were screaming out to the crowd, what has he done? What has he done? He was asking the Jews, what has he done? And people started shouting random things, just as they're doing with Paul. The government could not get reliable information as to why Jesus needed to die. They kept saying, you kill him yourself. Same way with Paul. And then they took him away. And people yelled, Get rid of him. This is the same Greek word here that was used for Jesus twice in Luke 23, 18 and in John 19, 15. Get rid of him. Get him out of here. Away with him. They wanted him to go to the cross. They wanted Paul to die. Now we know that Paul was not perfect like Jesus. But what were the similarities between Paul and Jesus? Paul was following Jesus very closely. And therefore, he was being persecuted just as Jesus was. And turn with me to John 15. John chapter 15, starting in verse 18. And this is Jesus talking to his followers. If the world hates you, understand it hated me before it hated you. If you were of the world, the world would love you as its own. However, because you're not of the world, but I have chosen you out of it, the world hates you. Remember the word I spoke to you. A servant is not greater than his master. If they persecuted me, 
they will also persecute you. As I said, Paul was not Jesus, but he was following Jesus, and therefore he was being persecuted. It comes down to this statement. If you hate Jesus, you will hate his church. If you love Jesus, you will love his church. Look around you today. Jesus died for these people here at Safe Harbor Baptist Church. He died for his church. Do you love them? Are you loving them? Then build them up and don't tear them down. So what is the opposite of the mob mentality? What is the opposite of screaming and yelling and fighting and violence and anger and blood? Unity for Jesus. Nothing is more comforting than a loving body of Christians coming together, loving each other, and loving our enemies as, as the Bible calls us out to do in multiple places, including Romans chapter 12. Loving our enemies. Why? Because we agree with them? No, not because we agree with them, but because we know they were created in the image of God. And they deserve the gospel just as much as we do. Nothing is more comforting than seeing hundreds, if not thousands, of Christians coming together and worshiping the Lord. In fact, uh, every two years there's a conference in Louisville called Together for the Gospel. And several of us church members are going to be going this year. Uh, but there's nothing like sitting in the Young Center, not having to watch the Louisville Cardinals, but sitting in the Young Center <laughs> and seeing eight to 10,000 people worshiping the Lord together, singing hymns. It, it, it just brings a warmness to your soul that you just can't even explain. Now there may be a time where we have to stand up for an injustice. There's no doubt about that. There's plenty of things going on in the world that Christians should not agree with and go along with. But the way that we do it speaks volumes. We should do it with grace and not violence. That doesn't mean that we won't stand up with a picket sign at some point. But the way that we handle it, thinking of others and thinking of the cross. Because when we look at the cross, we know what an angry mom can do. We see the ultimate violence that was placed on our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And it was within God's sovereignty for that to happen. But there's no more deep injustice than seeing the perfect Son of God dying on a cross, beaten down, and suffering. And because of that act of violence against our Savior Jesus Christ, then we know that we're free from that mentality. Thank you, Jesus. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, Lord, we praise you for your Son Jesus Christ, and we praise you for your Word, where we can see how we should live our lives. Because if we follow our own hearts, if we follow our own desires in our flesh, we know that it would lead down a path of death and destruction. We know that we are no better than any of these people that were in any of these mobs or riots that we see around the world, even that we read about in the Bible. None of us are above that. But Jesus came and received punishment that we deserve. And therefore, we can now live a life of peace, even if the world's not peaceful. Let us follow the example of Jesus, the example of Paul, as they face this persecution, disagreement, riots, threats, but they kept moving forward with the gospel of Jesus Christ. Why? Because they love you and they love people. So Lord, give us all a selfless, humble spirit and a love for others and a desire for them to know your Son, Jesus Christ. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.